Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the Midwest Dream Car Collection. We appreciate you all coming out this afternoon, this gorgeous, gorgeous afternoon. Um, this is part of our Morgan Family Lecture Series. This series was designed by the Midwest Dream Car Collection in honor and recognition of our museum founders and benefactors, Warden Brenda Morgan and family. So every year we try to get a speaker that's just has a phenomenal story and just uh, something that's going to be fun to share with you all. And this year we're really honored to have Patty uh, Upton. Patty's adventurous, adventurous spirit played an integral role, along with her husband Lauren, in the sand ship discovery journey. The Upton's legendary trek around the world was made in a modified American-made 1966 Jeep CJ5. The trip, which took place in the mid-1980s, took a north-south course, taking them from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, to Punta Arenas, Chile, including the first all-land crossing of the notorious Darien Gap of Panama and Colombia, all by motor vehicle. The Darien Gap alone is 125 miles of no roads, dense jungles, torturous rivers, rugged mountains, and swamps, taking the up to 741 days to complete. I haven't computed how far that is per day, but it's a little bit slower than my grandmother drove, I know that. This feat earned them a place in the 1992 Guinness Book of World Records. The expedition then continued from Cape Agulhas, South Africa, to Gamvik, Norway, 4,000 miles of four-wheeling in Africa, a life-threatening breakdown in the Sahara Desert, an eye-opening journey through the former Soviet Union. This, this overland journey of over 56,000 miles took five years and provided a lifetime of memories. Known for her resilience, Patty played a vital role in overcoming the challenges of these extreme environments, helping to document and complete this remarkable journey that pushed the limits of both human endurance and vehicle capability. Would you please help me in welcoming what I consider the female version of Crocodile Dundee, Patty Upton. Lauren Upton dreamt of being an explorer since the early age of seven. In 1975, he wanted to do something never before done. He decided he wanted to drive one American-made vehicle around the world on a north-south course, all on land except for the South Atlantic Ocean. There's a land route from Alaska to Chile and from South Africa to Norway. The only catch is there's no road linking the countries of Panama and Colombia. The gap in the highway is known as the Darien Gap, El Tapón de Darien, the stopper of the Darien. The Pan American Highway stretches some 19,000 miles from Alaska to Argentina, yet to be completed through the Darien Gap. During dry season, January through March of 1976, Lauren attempted to cross the Darien Gap driving a Ford F-250 pickup truck. As he terms it, the Ford looked good, but was totally overloaded. Every spare part he carried did not break, and everything that broke, he did not have. <laughs> Just a few short miles off an established gravel road in the Darien Gap, the Ford broke its rear axle housing, not just an axle shaft, the entire axle housing. While Lauren was away from camp trying to get parts, Larry, the team's remaining volunteer member, stayed with the Ford. Tragically, Larry was shot and killed. No one knows exactly what happened except the one who fired the shot, and he was never found. This tragedy ended Lauren's first attempt to cross the Darien Gap. Lauren returned to the Darien Gap in early 1977, driving a brand new CJ7 Jeep. This expedition was almost textbook perfect. They crossed the Darien Gap in 49 days, but the rainy season was fast approaching, so they traveled 8 to 10 miles, lashed atop a dugout through the vast rivers of the Atrato Swamp, hence not an all-land crossing. Several weeks later, this, became a point, this point became moot. While driving high in the Andean mountains of Ecuador, the road turned and Lorne didn't. The Jeep went over a 300-foot embankment. No major injuries to anyone on board, but as Lorne watched the headlights flip end for end, he began making plans for another expedition. While still making payments on the previous Jeep, Lauren purchased another brand new CJ, this one a CJ5, 1979, and started out again. Unfortunately, this expedition was not meant to be. While in the Darien Gap, Lauren had a run-in with a Colombian park official of the newly created Los Catios Park. 
Long story short, the park official wanted a payoff, and that was not in Lauren's character. Lauren made the mistake of telling the park official, you're going to need more men and guns to stop me. Poor choice of words. The corrupt park, park official returned with more men and guns. The new CJ-5 was abandoned deep in the jungles of the Darien Gap, and Lauren and his team got out with their lives. This is the hood of that 1979 CJ-5 Jeep. This photo was taken in 1986 by Helga Pedersen while crossing the Darien Gap by motorcycle. These words sum up Lauren's philosophy. They were painted on that 79 Jeep. And since Lauren said he would take one American-made vehicle around the world and not a series of them, he had to begin again. Timing was right for Lauren to begin the expedition at Rhodes End, Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. This was June 15, 1984, his 49th birthday. The ice was just breaking up on the Arctic Ocean. At this time, Jeep was owned by Renault, so Lauren wasn't sure it really was totally American-made vehicle, but it had that Ramsey Power takeoff winch on the front bumper, so that was a big selling point. He purchased this 1966 CJ5 Jeep made by Kaiser Corporation. She was christened the SS Sandship Discovery after one of Captain Cook's ships of the mid-1700s. Lauren was six feet, four inches tall, so he raised the hard roof four inches in order for him to see out the windshield. The Jeep is of the old style, narrow, and definitely top-heavy. Lauren started south. Arriving in Panama in October 1984, I joined the expedition as photographer, hence the lack of photos between Prudhoe Bay and Panama. Lawrence Upton, Lauren's 22-year-old nephew, flew down from the States to join the expedition. This is overlooking the Panama Canal from Contractors Hill. Before going on any trip, whether it's to grandma's or on expedition, you have to pack. Even the spare space around the Do Discovery's Dauntless V6 motor was packed. Shovel, pick, axe, jumper cables, shackles, snatch blocks, and a few miscellaneous spare parts. Bright and early on the morning of February 21st, 1985, we left the former canal zone, and seven hours and 172 miles later, we arrived at the small river town of Yavisa, the end of the Pan American Highway on the North American continent, and the beginning of the Darien Gap. For the first 30 days, we were accompanied by Ed Culberson on his motorcycle. Barely see it there on the far left. By lashing two dugouts together, the Discovery crossed the Rio Chukanaki at Yavisa, February 22, 1985. This was day one of the Darien Gap crossing. We crossed rivers but never traveled up or down them to avoid difficult areas. We hired locals to work for us. In this case, it was a Choco husband and wife team. He was our guide and she was our cook. They were way too young and inexperienced and they did not last long. Here they're standing in front of a sugarcane sugar cane press. Note the pipe bumpers with the chains hanging from each end, rear bumpers the same. These modifications will become very important later. Another modification ma Lauren made was what we called side hill adjusters. He welded a nut on the Discovery's frame and axle housing, front and rear, right and left sides. A turnbuckle would be inserted into the low side and tightened. This did two things. It took some of the play bounce out of the springs and it threw some of the weight to the high side. This was just a test of the side hill adjusters. They're on the low side, your left side. The wheels are at different elevations, but the hood is almost level. Fortunately for us, most of this tree had been cleared. We needed only to widen it to accommodate the discovery. Using only axes and machetes, it was usually quicker to go around larger trees than to chop them down. Prepar preparing to winch up out of a creek. Note the roof rack Lauren is standing on. Once camp was declared, this would become a table or bed and attached to the side of the discovery. Winching up out of that creek. Five days after crossing the Rio Chukanaki, we were totally lost. Basically, we were lost the entire time. We relied on local guides, but in this case, our young Choco guide was also lost. We heard voices on the trail behind us, and this little elderly black man walks into camp and hollers, Lorenzo! Miguel had worked for Lorne on one of his previous expeditions. Lorne asked Miguel if he wanted to work, and if so, bring three more able-bodied men the next day. One of these men would become our new cook. The young Choco couple were history. Yes, I had done laundry that day. 
negotiating a banana tree obstacle course, one of many. Bananas and plantanos are a staple in the local diet, so we did our best to maneuver the discovery through these plantations. We picked up some, a gringo hiking through the Darien Gap, Harold, a Frenchman who spoke fluent Spanish, something none of us could do. Driving into one of the countless gullies, the round pipe bumpers provided a gliding pattern for the discovery instead of crumpling or snagging as a stock bumper might do. Note the table bed attached to the side of the discovery. That's where Lauren would sleep. I slept inside the discovery and Lawrence had a small tent he would pitch. This particular night, however, Lawrence was quite sick and slept on the ground underneath Lauren's bed. This is the top of the M.A. Hill, the West Slope. It's a very steep slope with a very long drop into the M.A. River. Lauren turned the discovery around backwards, hooked up her winch, and slowly started lowering down the hill. And it wasn't until I had this film developed and looked at it carefully, I thought I was showing how steep that hill is. If you look carefully at that picture, you'll see the padlock that's on the door, as well as on the door right now. Gravity makes that padlock hang straight down. It's not hanging straight down in that picture. So if you can adjust your eyes and push that further up so that you can imagine that padlock hanging straight down, that's actually how steep that hill was. Within a short time, Lauren noticed he had no oil pressure. No oil pressure, the engine can't run. No engine, the Ramsey Power Takeoff winch cannot be operated. So the Wyeth Scott two-ton come-along was brought out and hooked up. We spent the next six hours hand winching 90 feet to the M.A. River. Almost down to the riverbed, and once there it was decided that possibly the rear main seal was leaking and causing the loss of oil when on a steep incline. We were able to add oil and maintain oil pressure once on the riverbed. However, the upside of the M.A. River Valley, the east slope, was as steep, if not steeper, and definitely much longer than the west slope. Going at such a snail's pace, Ed's motorcycle would be cabled to the rear of the Discovery, and he just had to keep it upright. The next two and a half days were spent hand winching the Discovery up what became known as East Mishap Hill. Every time Lawrence pulled on the handle of the come along, the discovery moved forward a quarter of an inch. Progress was slow, but it was in a forward motion. This was camp the second night up East Mishap Hill. The discovery at such a steep angle, a high lift jack was used to level her out so I could sleep inside and so that Lauren's bed would be sort of level. The men cut bamboo extensions for the table's legs. I could easily walk under the table. After two and a half days and 315 feet, every inch of it hand winched, we were finally at the top of East Mishap Hill. Discovery does a little three-wheeling, even with all the able bodies on the high side for extra weight. And you have to look carefully. Harold, the Frenchman's on the front bumper. Right behind him, there's another pair of feet also hitting the bumper. And then if you look back, you'll see a foot hanging out. Lawrence is evidently sitting in Lauren's lap. Um, and then there's probably a couple of people on the rear bumper as well. This was a group of Choco women and girls that walked through our camp. Their baskets were loaded with some sort of nuts. Note the straps across their heads for carrying the heavy baskets. This was the Choco village of Basal. Girls are pounding rice to break open the rice hulls. We crossed the Tweeter River on a balsa log raft built by the Choco natives. It's pegged and grooved. There are no nails or ropes holding it together. Again, another spectacular and successful crossing of a river. Shortly after crossing the Tweeter River, we came to an area of slash and burn. Most of the larger trees are felled, and then the area is burned just prior to being planted. This area was more difficult to travel through than the jungle. A great deal more cutting and winching of logs was required, and it was all done without the jungle canopy overhead protecting us from the hot tropical sun. Since crossing the Chukunaki River at Yavisa, the Discovery had traveled approximately 37 miles in 30 days, and we were still 18 miles from the Colombian frontier and that national park that had created trouble for Lauren in 1979. 
The rainy season was fast approaching, so Lauren decided to remain with the Discovery near the Kuna village of Pukuru. Lawrence and I returned to Panama via dugout and small bush plane. I went back to my job as office manager for the Girl Scouts in the Canal area. Lawrence returned to his job in the States. I would send supplies to Lauren via the missionary pilot that would fly into Pukuru about every six weeks. Lauren sums up his nine months in the jungle as watching the rains fall and the bananas grow. Dry season in the Darien Gap. This is the second dry season in the Darien Gap. I called my cousin Nick in the States and asked if he'd like to join the expedition for a few weeks. His brother-in-law, Don, also joined us. They both still speak to me. <laughs> January 11th, 1986, we hired the missionary pilot to fly us right into the village of Pukuru, saving a minimum of three grueling days travel by bus and dugout. Arriving at camp, we found it in a state of disarray. We were fortunate this season to have Margarito on your right as our guide. He'd worked for one of Lauren's previous expeditions. Margarito's an excellent man. The only word in English he knows is okay. In the middle was our cook for the season, Juan Rivas, also known as Cookie. I don't recall the name of the kuna on your left. Three days after Nick, Don, and I arrived, the Discovery had been serviced, tuned, all supplies were stored, and we were once again on the trail. Lauren saying goodbye to the village chief. The Discovery is able to squeak through the trees at wheel height, but the roof rack is snagging on a tree. By putting extra weight on the offside and Nick on the roof pushing, we're able to get through. Want to mention here, Lauren was the only one in the Discovery. Everyone else walked. The natives clear trail. Nick, Don, and I would make sure the trail was clear enough for the Discovery, that there was no small, sharp tree stump or to puncture a tire or a random twig to snag a fan belt. To make it easier to put men on the high side, Lauren removed the chains from the ends of the bumper, pipe bumpers, and we had short pieces of pipe we could quickly insert into the bumpers to make room for more people. Winching up out of a steep gully using a two-part line, Lauren devised what we call a cable drag to get the discovery down steep hills since we still, still had that leaky rear main seal. By attaching a cable to the eye bolt in the rear bumper, wrapping the cable around a tree at the top of the hill, running the cable down the hill, putting a log through the eye of the cable, and then men on the log, Lauren was able to drive down steep hills in a somewhat controlled descent using men and friction as braking power. Lauren giving directions for a winch job. Ideally, we wanted an English-speaking person controlling the winch cable, someone who understood how to spool the cable properly and not let it bunch up and possibly snap. During the first dry season, that was Lawrence's job, and this season, it was Nick or Don's. Using manpower to get over a fallen log, Nick and Don had been with us for 18 days, and we traveled 14 miles since leaving the village of Pukaru. It was time for them to return to their job in the States. This left just Lauren and me and the hired crew of natives. Preparing to negotiate a side hill, putting on the side hill adjusters on the low side, attaching cable to, the tree, to trees also on the high side, there's a snatch, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, reattaching the chains to the bumpers front and rear high side, attaching a cable to trees also on the high side, there's a snatch block on the cable, then by attaching the snatch blocks to the chain on the Discovery, Lauren's able to drive along the side hill. Bizarre sight of rusted remains of a Cor Chevy Corvair from the vehicle expedition in the 1960s. Palo de las Letras, Panama, Colombian frontier. It's marked by a rubble of concrete. We would have anywhere from four to 14 men working for us, a combination of chocos, kunas, and blacks. At this time, Cookie was the only black, and take it from me, never go on expedition without hiring a cook. There are few people in this world I can say I trust totally with my life, but Cookie and Margarito are two of those people. Mind you, I don't speak Spanish, and they don't speak English, but in the jungle, I trusted them totally. Margarito's not pictured because he was out in front searching trail. Inscription at the border, Colum Republic of Colombia, Highway of the Darien. 
Columbia is misspelled, and we've yet to see a highway. Once crossing the border into Colombia, we turned in a different direction in hopes to avoid the Los, Los Catios Park, a direction never before traveled by the few vehicle expeditions that have ventured into the Darien Gap. We encountered low but rugged mountains covered in thick virgin jungle. Margarito would be out front of us searching trail and marking it. He'd return to camp every few days to report and resupply himself. He came into camp and told us about Big Tree. Lauren said, you get us to Big Tree, I'll get us around it. Big Tree was on a very narrow ridge, not much wider than the Discovery. It was on, also on a very steep downhill slope. In order for the Discovery to be level so I could sleep inside, the men dug holes to drop the rear wheels into. The spare tire had to be removed from the tailgate in order to open it. The two tin boxes you see contain food, pots, and pans. The next day, using almost all of our equipment and a great deal of imaginative engineering, Lauren started the slow process of getting the discovery around Big Tree. First, the buttress type route was cut to allow a bit more room to get the discovery between Big Tree and Gregorio on your right. This is a view a bit further down the hill. Big Tree is just out of sight to your left. High lift jack and cable are attached, and Lauren starts around Big Tree. More cables were attached to the rear of the Discovery. Another view from the front. Bit of a balancing act. The front driver, the front tires drove over the exposed cut route just fine. But when the rear tires hit the route, the Discovery balked. So Lauren gave her a bit more gas. In doing so, she cleared the route, but the right rear axle shaft snapped. In hindsight, Lauren realized there was so much force holding the Discovery down that something had to give. If Lauren had used the winch instead of trying to drive, we might have avoided this mishap. We have finally broken out of the thick jungle, and we were entering an area of small family farms, so we were knew, knew we were out of the Los Catios Park. But we had also broken the left rear axle shaft by this time, and were winching totally. Margarito and Lauren removed the entire axle housing from the Discovery. We contracted with the local farmer to watch the Discovery for 50 cents a day. He built a wooden corral around her, and put up the rain, we put up the rain tarp and the Colombian flag, and there she waited. While we were waiting for a dugout to take us and the axle shaft out to the Colombian town of Turbo, we spotted this little girl. She wanted to play jump rope, and only her brother and the donkey helped her out. The axle housing was loaded on a dugout for its trip down to Turbo. Then it was hoisted onto the roof of a bus for its trip to Medellin, Colombia. Once in Medellin, it was left with friends of Lawrence until we could return with new axle shafts. Nine months later, January 1987, third dry season in the Darien Gap, we returned to the Discovery. We brought in the repaired rear end, a new battery, and some gasoline. She fired right up, ran on only about five of her six cylinders, but she ran. Clearing trail, plowing through mud, and more mud, and even more mud. The closer we got to the Atrato Swamp, the more mud we found. The map indicates a huge area covered by swamp on both sides of the Atrato River in Colombia. This is probably true during the rainy season, but during the dry season, a dry land route can be found. We'd hired Margarito as our guide again this year, and Cookie was, of course, our cook. Here's Cookie in his kitchen doing what he did best. Our meals consisted of oatmeal for breakfast, rice and beans for lunch, and beans and rice for dinner. Cookie's cleaning some fish he caught. The Rio Boca Chica posed a new problem for us. It's located in an area where no one lives, and there were no dugouts to use to, to cross the river. The river's about 30 feet wide and four and a half to five feet deep. We spent the next two and a half days preparing the banks, 
cutting and hauling trees to the river, using the Discovery's winch to haul the trees across the river, Lauren, a bridge builder by profession, is contemplating his design, lashing on a roadway, and finally Lauren drives the SS Discovery across the bridge. With the only gringos being Lauren and me, Lauren would drive the Discovery into position and then we, he would get out and hand the, handle the spooling of the winch cable and I would be inside behind the steering wheel operating the winch and taking directions from him. Crossing the Rio Sala Key on three dugouts and two balsa logs, all lashed together. During the heavy rains of the rainy season, these logs would wash down and form log jams. By laying the logs in an orderly fashion in front of the discovery, winching that short distance and repeating the process, these log jams were crossed. Traveling in the Atrato Swamp was challenging. Margarita was able to locate a dry land route for the discovery to travel. The darker green plants on the far right are standing in water, and the ground the discovery is on is not all that stable, as proven here. The discovery slipped a bit to the side towards the river and broke through the top layer of dry ground. Fortunately, there was a tree nearby to winch to. On March 4th, 1987, 741 days, 125 miles after the SS Discovery crossed the Rio Chukunaki in Panama, she crossed the Rio Otrato in Colombia. She did not set any speed records, but she did gain an entry into the 1992 Guinness Book of Records for the first all-land crossing of the Darien Gap by vehicle. From this town of Rio Sucio, we were able to travel on a rough dirt tractor trail. We drove 38 miles in 10 hours. That was the fastest we had driven in over two years. All the men were paid off, and Lauren and I continued on to Medellin, where the Discovery received some much-needed repairs. Crossing the equator in Ecuador. In Peru, the western side of the Andes is very dry. Only where a river flows out of the high mountains does it paint the valleys green with crops and towns flourish. And there were sand dunes. The vast Atacama Desert in northern Chile is one of the driest places on earth. We traveled with a British couple for a few weeks, on their, on, on the, and they were on their motorcycle. Southern Chile is just the opposite, lush and green. Here we have to yield to faster moving traffic. On May 9, 1987, we reached Road's End on the South American continent, about 38 miles south of Punta Arenas, Chile. We had recently learned that we had free passage across the South Atlantic Ocean to Africa for the Discovery, Lauren, and me. Our funds were rapidly dwindling, so this free passage was a welcome reprieve. It was about a $6,000 savings. Since we had the free passage, we splurged and took the ferry across the Straits of Magellan to the island of Tierra del Fuego and drove as far south as we could on the island. This is a few miles south and east of Ushuaia, Argentina on the Beagle Channel. Yes, that's snow on the Discovery. Loading the SS Discovery aboard the Greek freighter Aran in the port of Chile, in a port of, in Chile for our trip through the Straits of Magellan and across the South Atlantic. Those chains in the bumpers came in handy again. We were told that crossing the South Atlantic in August, we would most likely experience rough weather, and we did. We encountered two Force 9 storms during that 30-day passage. During the first storm, Lauren went up to the bridge in the middle of the night to have them turn on the floodlights to see if the Discovery was still strapped atop the front cargo hold. That's her on your left, directly behind a red cargo container. After arriving in Cape Town, South Africa, we spent a few hours steam cleaning both the inside and the outside of the Discovery. Then it was a little sightseeing. That's Table Mountain in the background. Road's End, southernmost road on the continent of Africa, Cape Agalas. The Indian Ocean and Atlantic Ocean meet just a few yards behind the Discovery. After leaving Cape Agalas, we spent six months sightseeing in South Africa and what was then known as Southwest Africa, now Namibia. This is a social weaver bird nest, or more rightly, condominium. Hundreds of birds weave these huge multiple nests. 
This is a family of meerkats that we shared our campsite with. They were very friendly and loved to have their bellies rubbed. The young one in the middle was a bit camera shy. Some of the animals weren't as friendly or furry. This elephant objected to us stopping and observing him. He threw back his trunk, bellowed, flapped his ears, all while charging, charging towards us. Fortunately, he stopped many yards away, but all of a sudden, the discovery felt very small and insignificant. This is the finger of God in Southwest Africa. It collapsed in December of 1988, about a year after we were there. Preparing to leave South Africa and head north, we wanted to make sure that it was known that the discovery was a real Jeep, not a Toyota Jeep or Land Rover Jeep or any of the other numerous four-wheel drive vehicles one sees in Africa. South Africa was still under the apartheid government when we were there, so we did our best to obscure the fact we'd been in South Africa. We removed labels from, the, from cans or painted them, and Lauren used a grinder to remove the words made in South Africa from our Firestone tires. International route, Cape to Cairo, or the sign says. We carried extra gasoline through Africa since we never knew where or if we would find some. The Discovery has three tanks, one under each seat and one in the rear, and they held a total of 44 gallons. With the extra jerry cans, we carried another 26 gallons for a total of about 70 gallons of gas. Main road through Zaire in Central Africa. Zaire is about the third the size of the United States, and when it gained its independence from Belgium in 1960, it had about 80,000 miles of good roads. When we were there in 1988, there were less than 5,000 miles of barely passable roads. Bridge on the main road through Zaire. This was one of many like this. Sometimes there were no bridges. We just had to ford the rivers. Main road through Zaire. I'm sure at one time this was a beautiful road. Eucalyptus trees lined both sides. In early 1988, when we were there, Zaire was led by the dictator Mobutu Sese Seko. He was one of the wealthiest men in Africa, and his country was one of the poorest. Minor traffic delay. Main road. Rush hour traffic. Broken spring, springs plagued us through most of Africa. Unfortunately, we were replacing them with someone else's discards. Here, we'd hit a stump that was hidden from view. By turning the spring around backwards and blocking and chaining it down tight, we were able to keep mov moving forward very slowly. Not sure what was going on here. Could have been road work. While traveling through Africa, our diet consisted a great deal of fresh vegetables and fruit, things that did not spoil without refrigeration, unlike some of the rather rank monkey meat sold at the markets. For the payment of a couple of cigarettes, this gentleman agreed to have his photo taken. Not sure exactly how this mode of transportation worked, we only saw them pushing these bicycles. Crossing the equator in Zaire, we thought we were overloaded. In the Central African Republic, the main road became the main rut. Full-size trucks would drive these routes when the ground was wet and the results were these ruts. The discovery was too narrow to drive in the ruts, so we had to straddle them. Entering Sudan, we passed by this camp of nomads. The camel was in good shape, but the cattle looked a little thin. It was like a scene out of the Bible, the men hauling water out of the well by hand. The only difference was the rope was nylon and the bucket was plastic. Sudan is not found on any tourist itinerary. It's usually only visited by aid workers, conflicts, and natural disasters. It's also about the third the size of the United States, but with only 800 miles of paved roads. When we arrived in Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, I was very ill and taken to a small hospital. Diagnosis was malaria and amoebic dysentery. After a short stay in hospital and a few weeks preparing for our trip north, we were off to Egypt, or so we thought. Unfortunately, my film was not advancing properly, but this is one of the only shots I have of our route through the Sea of Sand in northern Sudan. In the middle of June, the SS Discovery broke her right rear axle shaft. 
we'd already used our spare shaft. Daytime temperatures were in the 120 degree range. Last person we saw was 90 miles back tending a few goats. We were following the Nile River. It was our lifeline, water, and direction of travel. We had to swing out around a small outcropping of hills that came right down to the river. So when we broke down, the Nile was nowhere in sight. That first night was quite anxious. I don't think either one of us slept. The next morning, Lauren hiked up to the top of some nearby mountains. Fortunately, the Nile was only about a mile away and had a good current, but no civilization. So we made a plan. We sealed the seams of that tin box you see on the tailgate, making it watertight. We winched the discovery into some nearby brush so that she was out of sight, put a note on her window that we would return, and then we hauled all of our materials to the Nile River. We built a frame for our soon-to-be raft using the tin box to hold our supplies and the empty jerry cans for extra, extra buoyancy, and the SS survival ship Nile Queen was launched. She held all our supplies, food, bedding, clothing, and important papers. We floated in the water, holding on to our raft or to the inflated spare tire tube that was tied to the raft. Each night, we would climb out of the river and make camp, build a fire, boil drinking water, cook some beans, and lay in bed listening for a dog to bark, a rooster to crow, or a baby to cry. All we ever heard was the insistent hum of the hungry mosquitoes insects gathering outside our mosquito netting. Halfway through the third day, we spotted a white cone tent on the east bank of the Nile. We made our way there, and through hand gestures and broken English, we determined the local farmer's produce would be picked up that evening by truck and taken to the town of Wadi Halfa, and we could get a ride. Once in Wadi Halfa, we were deposited at the Crocodile Hotel. For 20 cents a night, we could sleep out front where Lauren and Mohammed, the proprietor, are standing. Or we could have the room there to the far right. Remember, it's summer in the Sahara and hot. We, we had opted for the two beds where Lauren's standing. A bit more air circulation, no privacy, but cooler. To your far left are the remains of the SS Nile Queen and an old diesel truck engine. The eating establishment was conveniently located right next door. On the menu was meat of unknown origin and dubious freshness, served with a generous helping of fool beans and a splash of what looked like 30 weight motor, motor oil. Love the potato masher the cook is using to stir the meat. From Wadi Halfa, there's a weekly train back 600 miles to Khartoum through the desert. On the morning of the day of departure, the whistle, a whistle's blown and those without a ticket rush through the gates and climb aboard the train in any manner possible. The miserable 36-hour train ride to Khartoum was in an incredibly overcrowded train car through a throat-choking, eye-stinging dust storm. Camp broke an axle. Once in Khartoum, we called my mother in Seattle and had her order the axle shafts. They were to be mailed to an employee of the U.S. Embassy in Khartoum. Lauren didn't feel comfortable leaving the discovery all alone out in the desert. He'd come too far for anything to happen to her. So we purchased about six weeks supply of food and took the train back to Wadi Halfa. This time the trip lasted 52 hours and was on a flat par. From there he hired locals to take him upriver in a boat to where the discovery waited. Ten days after my mother had mailed the package with axle shafts, I had them in my hands. However, one of those natural disasters that often visits Sudan arrived. Rains in the south of Sudan, Rains in the highlands of Ethiopia, rains in Khartoum. The Blue Nile and White Nile converge at Khartoum and both were in flood, the highest since 1946. The railroad tracks had been washed out somewhere north of Khartoum with no known repair date. I was stuck in the city and Lauren was stuck at Camp Broken Axle with no clue as to why I was not returning. I spent about two weeks knocking on doors, talking to government officials, aid workers, businessmen, asking anyone who would listen if they might be able to help me get to Wadi Halfa. The United Nations Development Program had the loan of a Belgium Air Force C-130 to fly relief supplies to Wadi Halfa, and it was arranged for me to be on board. An hour after leaving Khartoum, I was in Wadi Halfa. I hired locals to take me up, up the Nile to where Lauren waited at Camp Broken Axle. While I was gone, he'd gotten a great suntan, but he'd lost quite a bit of weight. Replacing the broken axle shaft was a 15-minute repair job. 
we'd gone to free floating axles after the problems in the Darien. You don't even have to remove the tire or jack up the vehicle. Just undo six bolts, remove the ac broken axle, insert the new axle, tighten up the six bolts. For that 15 minute repair job, we were down for 70 days. 36 miles and four and a half hours after leaving Camp Broken Axle, we were on a tarred road in Egypt. A good feeling. It, Africa was 4,500 miles of four-wheeling, more than a lot of Jeeps see in a lifetime. We visited Abu Simbel. The original temple was built around 1292 BC by Ramses II as a monument to the sun god. Those statues are 65 feet tall. When the Aswan High Dam was built in the 1960s, the temple was going to be lost to the rising waters of Lake Nasser. In 1965, through funding with UNESCO, the temple was cut apart and moved 200 feet above the river. Since it's now atop a hill, they had to construct a hill to build the temple into. The reconstruction is almost as fascinating as the original construction. The pyramids of Giza are lo located on the west bank of the Nile, about seven miles from Cairo as the dust flies. The largest, is, the largest and oldest is the Pyramid of Khufu. It's 13 acres at its base and is about 450 feet high. For 4,500 years, it stood as the tallest edifice in the world. From Cairo, it was under the Suez Canal through a modern tunnel into the Sinai Peninsula. This is just outside St. Catherine's Monastery at the base of Mount Sinai, where it's believed Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. From here, we drove to Israel and eventually into the occupied West Bank. In late September of 1988, when we were there trying to drive from Israel to Jordan, we came to a roadblock, both literally and figuratively. Israel and Jordan were technically at war and therefore provided a new obstacle to our all-land route. We tried talking to governments, embassies, tourist agencies, and the United Nations, all to no avail. So there remained a gap in our world circumnavigating expedition, one posed by human nature and not mother nature as the Darien Gap. Unable to drive to Jordan, we returned to Egypt and took the ferry to the town of Aqaba. We visited Petra, which was built during the 4th through 2nd century BC. This is called the Treasury. It's one of many buildings carved into the red sandstone. You might recognize it from several Hollywood movies. From Jordan, we traveled through Syria and into Turkey. The Cappadocia region of Turkey is a vast area of dwellings and churches carved into unusual rock formations. It could date as far back as 1800 BC. From Turkey, it was through Bulgaria and into Romania. Romania was under the communist government led by Nicolae Ceausescu. In Bucharest, we were to pick up our papers to travel into the Soviet Union as we had prearranged in Cairo at the Soviet Union Interest Office. When we arrived at the Interest Office in Bucharest, they had never heard of us. No big surprise there. They told us it would take several weeks to get the necessary paperwork done, and since winter was fast approaching, we decided to head to England and spend the winter there. Lauren spent the winter at Chislet Court Farm near Canterbury. I flew back to the States, got a job, wrote lots of letters seeking sponsorship, most of which we received in the form of products. I returned to England in May of 1989, and we traveled back across the English Channel to Calais, France, and then it was through France, Belgium, Netherlands, West Germany, East Germany, Poland, and finally into the Soviet Union. Travel in the Soviet Union was strictly, strictly regulated and controlled by in-tourist. We could not drive before daylight or after dark. We could not drive more than 500 kilometers a day. We had to stay in pre-approved campgrounds and motels, all paid for before we left England. Our paperwork called this a first-class tourist motel located near Minsk. This was our room. This was our bathroom. This was the view from our first class tourist motel, all for the, prepay, all for the price of $90 that we had to prepay. Entering Moscow, St. Basil's Cathedral, built by Ivan the Terrible in 1554. He supposedly had the architect blinded so he could never build anything as beautiful. It was closed while we were there. To your far left is Kremlin and Red Square. I'm sure this is proclaiming something great about Mother Russia. Camp, our last night in the Soviet Union. Lost. 
We couldn't find our way out of Leningrad, so the Soviet Navy came to our rescue. Crossing the Arctic Circle in Finland, lots of mosquitoes, much more bothersome than the, in the jungles of the Darien Gap. Reindeer in Scandinavia are like cattle in the western United States and are open range. They seem to like being out in the road, and I think it's because there were less mosquitoes out in the sun than there was back in the woods. The end is near. The small fishing village of Gamvik, Norway. Just a bit north of Gamvik, we arrived at Road's End, the Sletnes Lighthouse, July 4th, 1989. Just over five years and 56,000 miles, we'd reached the end of the road. After taking one American-made vehicle around the world, Lauren decided that it would be most fitting to end the trip on that all-American holiday, the 4th of July. Having gone to Road's End on the island of Tierra del Fuego, we decided to go to the island of North Cap and drive as far north as possible. Land of the midnight sun, the photos taken at 22 minutes past midnight, and the sun is due north of us, but unfortunately a storm had blown in and obscured it. From Norway, we traveled back through Sweden, Denmark, West Germany, and finally into the Netherlands, from where the discovery was shipped back to the States. Lauren and I were flown back to the States courtesy of American Airlines. And just for the record, our most time-consuming border crossing was getting the SS Discovery back into the United States. Seven hours. But wait, there's more. The thought of that one remaining gap in Lauren's all-land expedition around the world nagged at him. But as the years went by, old age and the complications that went with it began to show themselves both in Lauren and the Sandship Discovery. Lawrence, Lauren's nephew visited us in Salmon uh, late in the summer of 2016 and saw the condition of the Sandship Discovery after 25 years in dry dock. He decided to spearhead a project and took the discovery to his place in Washington State. He started a GoFundMe account with four goals in mind. Refurbish the discovery, make her drivable and stoppable. Get Lauren and the discovery and me to Israel to close the final mile. Find someone who will write the story of the Sandship Discovery. Find a fitting home for the Sandship Discovery. We were originally planning on returning to Israel sometime in the fall or winter of 2018, 30 years after we were first there. However, things began to happen, and most importantly, Greg, longtime employer of ours, put up the finances for our airfare and the Discovery's round-trip sea transportation to Israel. With one stipulation, the trip to be completed during the spring of 2018. Greg was concerned about Lauren's health becoming an issue, so the sooner the better. In October 2017, things went into high gear. After hearing Lawrence's stories of the discovery, a good friend and coworker, Mike Merck, and his father, Larry, who are both are mechanics, jumped at the opportunity to help. The final product was amazing and was accomplished by lots of love, volunteers, and its fair share of frustrations. Early in February 2018, Lauren and I went to Richland, Washington to see the completed discovery and meet the dedicated crew that made it happen. On our entire trip around the world, Lauren had always been in the driver's seat, both literally and figuratively. I was always in the passenger seat as navigator. Due to some of Lauren's health issues, our roles had changed. I would now be driving the discovery, something I had never done. When we were in Richland, Lawrence took me out for a test drive, eye-opening to say the least. There's power nothing on the Jeep. The lack of power steering was reasonable, but the lack of power brakes was going to be a bit more challenging to overcome. Late in the afternoon of February 4, 2018, the Sandship Discovery was loaded into a car hauler and sent to Galveston, Texas. Lauren and I arrived in Israel on the 9th of April. The discovery, due to several delays, did not arrive till the 19th of April, 10 days later than originally planned. In addition, the 19th was the beginning of a three-day holiday, countrywide, countrywide holiday. Finally, on the 25th of September, we had all the paperwork cleared and we were ready to head south to Elot and the Yitzhak Ravine border crossing. But as Lauren once told me, some days things go like clockwork. Other days, like the clock, was not even considered. This was one of those days. The discovery would not start, low battery from others trying to start her, and what appeared to be a totally flooded engine. Disappointing to say the least. I had friended someone on Facebook, 
many months earlier, a jeeper named Yanoff in Israel. That night, I messaged Yanoff and said, we're in need of help. Yanoff's reply was, don't worry. Early the next morning, we arrived back at the port and met Mayer, a friend of Yanoff's, also a jeeper, and he worked at the port. He took control of everything, and we sat back and waited. Udi Nam, the tow truck driver you see here, also a jeeper, arrived and loaded the Discovery on his truck. Udi took us and the Discovery, sorry, something popped up on my screen. I wasn't sure what that was. Udi took us and the Discovery to the local mechanic to sh who works on Jeeps. His shop's located about 30 miles from the port of Ashdod, where we were staying. The mechanic first checked the motor oil and found that the gas had gotten into the oil from being flooded. We left the Discovery with the mechanic, and Udi then took Lauren and I back to our apartment in Ashdod. When we tried to pay Udi for our tow to the mechanics and our trip back to Ashdod, he would not accept payment. All he would say is, it's a Jeep thing. Okay, let me get rid of that. After five days, the mechanic said the discovery was ready. The bill was settled by a group of Jeep enthusiasts and, one, and the one Jeep's par Jeep parts store in the entire country. However, the repair was not without its problems. One day everything was fine, then the next day not so much, and then everything would be fine again. With all of this uncertainty, combined with Lauren's health issues, he was having second thoughts and concerns about the wisdom of us heading on a 400-mile round trip through the Negev Desert of Israel in a vehicle he no longer had total confidence in mechanically. So we contacted Udi, the tow truck driver. Unfortunately, he was not available to haul us to Elot, but a friend of his was. Early on the morning of May 3rd, we all headed the 200 miles south to Elot. At 1 p.m., we arrived at the Yitzhak Rabin border crossing. I can't make a right. I can only go, I mean, I can't make a left. I can only go right. I'm telling I can't make a right. I can only go, I, I can, huh? I can only go right. I can't hear you. He's saying it's missing. I, I say I know I can't do anything about it. Airport streets where we were, it's now a divided road. When we were there 30 years ago, it was just a two-lane road. It says only one road, turn around and go back. Close your door. As I made this turn, his we did door. It, guys. We did it. We're on our way back. It's 120. and a half hours and four and a half miles after we returned to Israel and the final mile was a done did thing 30 years after we were originally in Israel and Jordan. On May 6th we dis delivered the discovery to the port of Ashdod for her return to Galveston. We then took time to visit one of our benefactors Itzhak and Itai Yanovich in Tel Aviv, owners of the only Jeep parts store in the entire country. This is Itzhak with one of his fully restored Jeeps, Jeepsters. Photo taken by Gilad, the shipping agent, on May 17th as the Discovery boards her ship back to Galveston, arriving on June 26th. Arriving in Richland, Washington on July 10th, over five months from when she left. Again, she had starting problems. And according, according to Mike Merck, the, the float had a tiny pinhole along the seam that caused it to fill with gas especially after it would sit for any length of time, thus causing the entire engine to flood and not start. Once back at the Merck's house in Washington, the Sandship Discovery got a good bath, rinsing off all her salt water. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate this.